<laughs> Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our planting and pruning deciduous bare root fruit tree class from the UCCE Stanislaus County Master Gardener Program. I am Ann Shellman, the coordinator for our group. And before we get started, I want to say a special thanks to the San Joaquin County Master Gardeners because we used a lot of their slides for this presentation. So who are the Master Gardeners? If you have attended our classes, you have probably seen this slide. For everybody else, our mission is to extend research-based information and knowledge about home horticulture, pest management, and sustainable landscape practices. And our audience is you, the home gardener. And Master Gardener programs are located throughout the state. So if you are not in Stanislaus County, most likely there is a program in your area. So please type into the chat, tell us where you are from. And um, if you don't already have a copy of the presentation, we will send it again. And uh, one of our speakers has a dog barking in the background. <laughs> because we're all at home. Uh, and so if you live in another state, uh, there are Master Gardener programs there. So has anybody told us? Uh, it looks like we have one person from Modesto. Uh, Juanita, she set her alarm, so she didn't miss the class. Good job, Juanita. She uh, was able to vote on the poll. She's saving her apple and pear seeds, which we will talk about uh, possibly why you may or may not get the same uh, fruit tree that you plant. So I'm glad you brought that up, Juanita. Mm -hmm. Okay, so most of you should already be signed up for our newsletter where we sell, uh, where we don't sell anything, <laughs> where we send out information about gardening and pest management. And um, that should usually be weekly. And then we'll tell you about upcoming classes. If you aren't already following us on social media, we are on these different channels. And then we also have our very own YouTube channel where I mentioned earlier that we have a lot of different classes on there like pollinator gardening and spring and fall vegetable gardening herbs. And uh, we hope you will check out our channel and we hope you will subscribe. So today we are going to be talking about temperate deciduous fruit trees. We are focusing in on bare root fruit trees, but these are trees that lose their leaves each winter. So deciduous is just a fancy word for losing leaves. And the ones we're talking about lose their leaves in the winter. If you were wanting to tune in for tips on citrus, we will be doing a class on that in the future. Uh, it's not a topic for this class because this is considered a subtropical plant and it's evergreen. But if you were wondering what you should do right now about citrus, the good news is nothing. Just pick your oranges or uh, lemons or whatever is ripe. You only need to prune citrus for size and shape and that needs to be done in spring. So you wanna wait until uh, later on in March and April if you're gonna do any pruning. If you prune now, you encourage new growth and little critters that are pests that are waiting around that normally would die because they prefer new foliage now have a place where they can hang out and continue to live and damage your tree. So the only thing you would do right now is prune these suckers below the bud union if you do have those. And now I am happy to welcome our two speakers Hector and Johnny, and then a little later on, we're gonna hear from Vicki Salinas, our speaker who is from the Stanislaus County Library. So Hector and Johnny, take it away. Hello, my name is Hector, and I've been a master gardener since uh, 2020. And currently I am working on a quarter acre market garden. And eventually I'd like to make, uh, have a, a backyard orchard, like a mini orchard, which is why I'm interested in uh, fruit trees right now. Hello, my name is Johnny Mullins. I've been a master gardener for two years now, same as Hector. However, I have been a gardener for over 50 years and I've been growing fruit and vegetables in the Central Valley since 1984. And I'm looking forward to our class this evening. Let's get started with our agenda. What will we be covering? First item, what is a bare root fruit tree? We will offer some helpful tree terms and help you in choosing a tree. Once you have your tree, then how to plant and irrigate it. And then when it starts to grow, pruning and thinning. 
And we'd also go over, if time permits, some of the fruit tree varieties that are available in this area. And if you have any questions, please hold until the end of each section. Bare root fruit tree. These are dormant trees without leaves. It is really is just a bare stick. And they are available from December to mid February, usually through March 1st, which primarily is the month of January. This is probably the best month for, for the dormant tree. Once leaves appear, the trees are then potted in the nurseries. The potted trees are higher priced due to the care needed until sold. So not only is this a great time to grow and plant bare root trees, but it's also cheaper. Here we have a diagram of a bare root fruit tree. You will see the grafted young tree that is grown in the wholesale nursery. The top of the tree or the scion is your desired tree, such as your peach or your apple. And that is grafted onto the bottom, the rootstock, which is the same species, but chosen for disease resistance and root quality, etc. If you see on the right there, the graft union is quite prominent. Choosing a tree. It's helpful to know these terms when you go to the nursery looking for your tree. Climate zone or plant hardiness zone. Where are we? Chilling hours, how many chilling hours needed? Root crown, what is a root crown? And pollination, what happens? And a pollinizer, what is a pollinizer? That sounds threatening. Climate zones or plant hardiness zone map, you see down the bottom right. The hardiness zone is based on the annual minimum temperature. The USDA has 11 zones. One is the coldest and 11 is the warmest. Stanislaus County is USDA zone 9 through 9B with a minimum, minimum temperature of 25 to 30 degrees Fahrenheit. And about 10 days ago, we had an overnight temperature of 29 degrees, which fits right into that bracket. And according to the Sunset Western Garden Book, we are in Sunset Zone 14. Chilling hours, what are chilling hours and why are chilling hours required? These are the number of hours below 45 degrees Fahrenheit that occur between November 1st and February 15th needed by a fruit tree to produce fruit. And for example, a fig needs as little as 100 hours, but most fruit will require 200 to 800. If they don't get the required chilling hours, the buds can be killed and you will end up with poor fruit set. All right, so um, why do I need to know this? Uh, the reason we're going over topics like chilling hours and climate zones is to help you choose the right cultivar for your climate. Um, so a cultivar is another word for variety, like a Fuji apple is an example of a cultivar. Um, local nurseries choose cultivars that thrive locally and big box stores and online stores may carry several uh, trees for several climate zones. Um, so it's always good to do your research um, and look into the cultivars you're interested in and make sure they're right for the USDA zone uh, 9B. Um, so when it comes to um, when it comes to bearing fruit, um, there are some details when it comes to the um, the right kinds of trees and the right kinds of uh, oh, sorry. Oh, we're going to be going over some uh, sorry uh, fruit terms. I got ahead of myself. Um, for instance, a pollinator is an insect um, that carries pollen between flowers. Pollination is when you get a pollen grain that fertilizes a flower to develop fruit. And a pollinizer is a term used for a fruit tree that provides pollen to nearby trees. Next slide. And um, some trees need a pollinizer. Um, should you get one? And that depends on whether the tree that you want to get is self-fruitful or self-unfruitful. So um, self-fruitful trees um, are able to uh, um, 
produce fruit on their own. They don't need a pollinizer. You can plant one and still be able to get a harvest. But self-unfruitful trees don't um, cannot produce fruit on their own. They need another tree of the same type or similar type in order to produce fruit. And some trees need a right kind or an appropriate pollinizer. And so um, to figure out which trees need a pollinator, generally speaking, most apples, pears, plums, and cherries need to cross pollinate. And these are the ones that are self unfruitful and need the right pollinizer. But apricots, citrus, nectarines, and peaches are mostly self fruitful. So you can just plant one of these and you should be fine. And it's always good to ask if you're not sure. So here's a chart. Uh, that shows you um, the details needed to figuring out what the right pollinizer is for your uh, tree, specifically for sweet cherries. Um, you can see at the very bottom though, there are some exceptions to the rules. Lapins and Stella are self-fruitful cherries, um, but it's always recommend that you, you know, plant you know, two of these at once. And then for more information on pollinizer resources, you can check out the Home Orchard book, which is for sale in our office, and it's also online. Or for a free resource, you can check out Dave Wilson Nursery online. Um, they sell uh, fruit trees, but also have a lot of information about them. And, you know, always, it's always best to also check the tag um, at the nurseries of the trees you're, inter you're interested in, and they may give you a lot of information. In fact... I have a tag here and it tells you 100 for a fig, 100 chilling hours and it's self-fruitful. It, it does have them on the tag. All right, so we don't have any questions at this time. So let's go ahead and forge on. And remember, if you have any questions to type them in the chat or rather the Q&A, although there's not that many folks on, so either one is fine. All right, you guys ready? We'll carry on. Now it comes time to choose a tree. And the question is, what size tree are you going to choose? The standard is anywhere from 20 to 25 foot tall. The semi-dwarf on dwarfing rootstock, anywhere from 20 from 12 to 20 foot tall, and genetic dwarf, anywhere from eight to 12 foot. And again, these sizes not always true. Some are larger, wider. And down at the bottom, you saw it's just a comparison diagram there. Again, depends on the area that you have to devote to an orchard. Semi-dwarf trees. These are the most common size sold. The name though is misleading. They usually are taller and wider than expected. And the care of a large trees can be difficult and time consuming. That's a lot of fruit to pick, a lot of pruning that has to be done and a lot of pests to manage. And if you have to spray, that's a lot of spraying. Dwarf fruit trees. Only peaches, nectarines, apple, and citrus are grafted onto true dwarf rootstock. And the fruit bush sized trees. You prune your new tree just before or after planting. This is not something that you can go to the nursery and say, I would like a fruit bush size, please. This is something that you craft yourself. It results in an easy care tree that provides a lot of fruit. And we will talk more about this later. The advantages and disadvantages of a fruit bush. The advantage is tree maintenance without a ladder. Your spouse will love you and you don't have to get in the ladder to pick fruit. Trees for small spaces. You can have many trees in that space and sequential ripening. We'll talk about that later. The disadvantages, of course, you have less fruit. You don't have any shade to sit under and your timing of pruning is critical. You have to keep up on that pruning. 
choosing your trees. New gardeners, don't overplant fruit trees are a lot of work. I found that out about 20 years ago. They are an immense amount of work when it comes to thinning and pruning. Research cultivars, for example, peaches. What color do you prefer, yellow or white? What type, tree stone or cling, fresh or for canning? What's your favorite flavor, tart, mild, sweet, etc., or your favorite texture? Do you like them juicy and soft or nice and crispy? Want fruit all season long. Note the fruit harvest peach period from your peaches. You can have peaches some ready in May, June, July, August, or September. There are many varieties out there. Plant early, mid, and late season types for a long, long harvest. Any questions? You're muted, Anne. Okay, so, <laughs> oh, that makes me laugh. How long have I been doing this and I already forgot about getting muted? Okay, can a self-fruiting cherry be used as a pollinator? This question is from uh, Teresa. Do you guys know the answer by any chance? You can plant two Stellas together. Okay. And, and that would get you, that helps you with getting the Stellas, which are self-fruiting to um, pollinate each other. But let me go back to this slide here where we had the cherries, if I can. Hopefully I'm not going to make anybody dizzy. Boy, I think yeah, Teresa, I, I what do you so. think, Hector? Well, I mean, it looks like you might be able to for some, like for instance, the black tart um, and then those accept all varieties. So um, in that instance, a uh, self-fruiting cherry like Lapins or Stella would probably work. Um, but for others, I look, they require a specific one. And I'm not sure exactly why, like for instance, the Bing cherry up the, at the top requires a variety like black tart, Banner Rainer. I, I was thinking maybe it could be because those um, two uh, tr varieties um, uh, like set uh, blossoms around the similar time. But I'm, that's something that I also should look up. That's a good question, by the way. That's a very good question. And uh, Hector and Johnny and I have been um, going over a lot of this information for the past two months, and there is a lot to it. I have to say out of every kind <laughs> of class you could possibly teach, this one has the most if this then that but yeah. that and you could use this as a word problem for somebody you know mm -hmm. if you have a black tartarian cherry what do you need um i think actor's explanation makes a lot of sense so if we find out any new information we will pass that on to Teresa. um for now i will go back and i think somebody else might have written in here oh stephanie's asking a really good question um Oh, and also, I'm not sure if I'm saying your name right, Juan. Uh, I have one dwarf cherry tree in a pot. What if I forgot the variety? Tricky. Do I need to get a pollinator and are pollinator fruits non-edible? Ooh, this is a tricky one. Um, from my understanding, I don't know that there are dwarf cherries. However, it's possible they exist and somebody put this cherry on a dwarf rootstock. So it depends on where you got it, if there's any way you could contact them. Um, and I'm not sure what county you're from. You could bring some of the cherries in uh, when they're ready to a local cooperative extension and see if we could help you or uh, maybe even to you know, another, another place would be if you live near a wholesale nursery like Dave Wilson or somewhere like that, we could try to figure it out for you. Do you need a pollinator? That depends, like Hector was saying, on which one you have. Um, are pollinator fruits non-edible? And no, they should all be edible is my understanding. Yeah. 
I'm curious though, have you gotten fruit from this um, dwarf cherry tree? Oh, great, if so, great then um, maybe if you've gotten fruit yeah, and, and you're content with the amount you got, then you probably got a variety that um, doesn't need one. But yeah, I'm, I'm curious now. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, it kind of ties into Stephanie's question because she's asking, can dwarf varieties be grown in pots and what difference in care do they need? Um, and Hector and Johnny, I'm not sure if we spoke about this, but my research shows from what I can tell that you would need an enormous pot to grow most varieties. Um, I don't even know if a dwarf variety would do that well in like a five or 10 gallon pot. Mm -hmm. I guess if you're going bigger than that, um, what, do you, what do you guys know about that? I know that, that uh, fruit trees don't grow very well in pots because of the heat here in the summertime, they dry out too quickly. It's very, yeah, very you... difficult, very difficult to, to grow. You think of that root system and how it kind of grows and it needs to grow out, like that picture that we showed at the beginning. Uh, I don't know of too many um, successfully grown fruit trees in containers. In fact, um, no, I've tried it unsuccessfully. You have, yeah. And so that is one of the things um, I know I was writing about it in our blog post and I mentioned that you really can't. And I said, to take the sting out of it, you could grow a kumquat, which is a citrus because in the article I wrote, it was essentially about, you know, we were inviting people to this talk and then it was like, what if I live in an apartment or what if I have a small place? Um, you can grow blueberries, strawberries, uh, and then you could grow a dwarf kumquat, but that was all the information I was able to find about growing these types of trees. Um, and so there's a couple more questions here. Alicia was asking if the cherry tree had been pruned to be dwarf. So it could be like if you pruned it to be a fruit bush, but like Johnny said, I think the roots are just gonna get too big. And then um, in our climate, even growing a tomato plant over the summer that is indeterminate is risky, just mm -hmm. trying to keep up with the water. Have we answered everybody's questions, you think? Great questions. And I'd like to uh, offer something here too. And it was not always the case, but if you're living in a subdivision, most people have, or a lot of people have cherries and apples. And someone said, just, just get a cherry and put it out there. Someone's probably has a pollinizer. <laughs> Good point. Next door, you don't know. I mean, I have a pluot and the plum that I had for pollinizer I took out many, many years ago but I still got a great crop every year because somebody around here has got a plum. And so the so person who had the um, cherry tree in a pot that wonders about the pollinizer, um, they did not uh, reply to see, um, to answer our question we asked about if, that Hector asked if they had had fruit before. So, um, We'll see if they end up replying and then uh, we can go from there, so. Oh, um, uh, Alicia mentioned that she um, pruned the nectarine in a three gallon pot, 24 nectarines this year. That's pretty cool. So maybe there are exceptions. Oh, I'm um, just seeing that. Uh, how, old, yeah. how old is that tree, Alicia? I wonder how she's keeping that watered. That's pretty cool. All right, well, it sounds like we've got something to learn from her. Thank goodness she's a master gardener, right? <laughs> um, also, uh, just a side note, one of the, regarding pollinizers, I've read that um, if you don't want to plant the pollinizer tree to go along with, uh, you know, the tree that you want to grow fruit from, um, it, depending on how good you are with grafting, um, some people have grafted, um, you can graft like the like a, um, a branch from a pollinizer onto your tree 
and that might be a way to you know get through without having to plant a, another a second tree for Ooh, a tax as a pond. Yeah, that is a great um comment and I apologize I forgot that my um screen is a touch screen <laughs> and I was trying to wipe something off of it okay and I <laughs> boy here we go right all right we're just here for uh learning and and entertainment oh wow Alicia's tree is seven years old from seed okay so now she's going to disprove everything we're saying However, uh, usually it's difficult to get the same fruit from a tree that was a seedling, but it's not impossible. Mm -hmm. All right, let's continue. Um, I don't know if Alicia would uh, would be able to, or would if you can uh, in the chat write like how do you take care of it? Because I'm really interested in like learning more about this now and seeing. Uh, it's possible. Oh, uh, sometimes we can, the method. yeah. So as far as the chat and the Q and A, you can write to people, um, and then you can yeah. say that you answered it via chat, or you can um, repeat their questions and ask them out loud. So I can go through and kind of um, clear out the ones we've already answered. So we'll see the new ones here in just a moment. Cool. All right. Thank you very much, Alicia. That's pretty cool. All right. So, um, all right, so um, before you plant, there you go. So in this section, in this set of slides, we're going to go over some things to consider before you plant your tree, like choosing the site to plant your fruit trees, preparing the site, and some additional planting tips. So um, before you buy a fruit tree, it's important you've planned out where you're gonna put them. I know some people who buy plants impulsively but without considering where they're gonna put them and it just becomes more trouble for them to take care of that plant in the planter, or in this case, bare root, uh, you know, in the case of bare root fruit trees. So um, so for site selection, you'll need a site that's uh, where you get full sun. It's, an, it's important to um, that your tree is near a water source. A water source nearby helps uh, making taking care of your fruit tree more convenient and means less materials needed to transport the water to them. Uh, make sure you selected an area that has plenty of space uh, for your fruit trees to grow into and also leaves you enough space to access it. So to make it easier on your tree, avoid planting a lawn, in a lawn to reduce competition between the lawn and your tree. Um, if you can't, and if you absolutely have to put your tree in a lawn, then make sure that that lawn is kept at least three feet away from the trunk. This also helps prevent uh, damage from a string trimmer. All right, so um, to, get your side red, to get your site ready for your tree, make sure that your soil has good drainage. The soil should be loose and easy to dig to at least two feet deep. Um, otherwise, the tree's health will suffer. So if you need to, you can break up the so break up your soil as needed, and you can use an auger to do so. Those help. All right. So um, there you go. So some tips on taking care of your um, bare root trees at home: make sure you prepare the holes ahead of time or as soon as you get home, and the tree roots should be wrapped in wet paper or newspaper on your um, to transport home. It it helps. Um, and if you can't plant them right away, then you should uh, heal them in, meaning dig a shallow hole, lay the tree on the ground um, in the uh, in the hole in water uh, and cover the roots as needed. And uh, should I amend the soil? So um, research shows that adding amendment to the planting hole is not beneficial. Um, I'm guilty of this. Um, in the past, if I would plant a, a, like a fruit tree, a potted fruit tree or a potted plant, I would um, dig the hole and mix into the hole like compost along with the native soil and then plant the tree there or the plant there. But um, research shows, like, like it says here, that um, it may not be benefit. It's not beneficial. It creates a different kind of soil um that the roots will not want to venture out of and could lead to those roots kind of like um you know a uh, root balling uh, as as i think of that term i think that's the right term to put it but um 
but if you want to amend uh, your soil, you can add compost uh, and till over the area before planting. Or if you have uncomposted amendments like manures, um, you could till those into the soil a few months before planting your tree. So when it comes to planting, um, dig a hole, uh, dig a wide hole the same depth as the root tree area. Be careful not to bury the crown, and we'll get into why that's important later. And then lightly tamp uh, the soil as you fill around roots to eliminate the air pockets. So root crown is where the root and the where the trunk joins the roots. It's um, and it needs to be planted high and kept dry. And the reason being is because um, if you bury the root crown and it stays moist, it can be susceptible to um, disease. Um, next slide. But yeah, yeah, burying the crown is a common cause of tree failure. And um, this is often is not detected until years later. So all that time you put into taking care of that tree can be you know, gone because um, it will die of disease later on. And then yeah, crown and root rot diseases kill the tree. And this is caused by microbes in the soil. Any questions? Don't see any questions, but Roe is advising everyone to be careful not to plant too close to property line fences, which I disagree because my neighbors provide me with oranges and lemons every year. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> but I know what she means. I know what she means. Um, citrus trees are not quite as obnoxious as something like a um, nectarine or peach or something that's getting really big. But I know growing up, our neighbors loved picking our cherry trees on their side of the fence. But yes, some people may complain um, because they don't like the mess. But I don't see any other questions. So we will just move on and there will be time for more questions shortly. Now that your tree is in the ground, now that it's planted, what do you need to do? We have irrigation, you need to protect the trunk, and you need to fertilize. And if you look there on the right, there's a picture of a tree that does not have a three foot spacing to the pollen. And that's a tree trimmer doing the damage that Hector said it shouldn't do. So be careful, leave a gap around the tree. Irrigation, water after planting, keep soil very moist. Build a donut basin around the tree. This can be helpful. And we look back at the, the diagram there. You build a little mound and fill it with water. Year old trees need five to 10 gallons of water per week, less with three to six inches of mulch. If you do use mulch, make sure you keep it away from the base of the tree. You don't want that getting wet as well. Here you can see a irrigation with emitters and the arrow is pointing the emitters which are away from the root crown. Again, as I said, keep the area around the roots moist and water or use emitters but don't have them next to the trunk. What do people think tree roots look like? I think this is everybody's concept. It used to be anyway. You would have deep, deep roots, usually a tap root and roots coming out off of that. In reality, typical tree root growth is a lot shallower, 18 inches, and they spread out beyond the drip line. Now, when you're watering, water growing trees under the canopy, out of the drip line, water to a depth of 18 inches. And you can always check that by taking a shovel and digging down and just to see how far down your water is going. Tree protection. If sunburn is a problem on trees in your yard, you can use paint on the young tree trunks. Mix a solution of indoor latex paint and water, 50-50 proportion. This helps prevent sunburn and borers. 
but doesn't prevent these problems if the tree is not watered correctly. Fertilizing. Purchase fruit tree fertilizer and follow the instructions for the amount and timing. You may need some to do some math with this so we don't over fertilize or under fertilize your new fruit tree. Any questions? Hector, can you see the question from Stephanie? It says, um, on some of the trees, the planting instructions advise to dig the planting hole two or three times the size of the root ball. Follow those instructions or follow Hector's the size of the root ball, which actually <laughs> takes us back to the name of our class, which is bare root fruit tree planting. So what Hector is referring to is digging for the bare root fruit trees um, Stephanie is mentioning the root ball, and that would be if you bought a potted tree, if that makes sense. Hector, you want to add anything? Uh, no, I think, you, I think that's a pretty good response. But yeah, um, like Stephanie Hector's Stephanie is biased and likes what you have to say <laughs> better, <laughs> which is, you know, nothing okay. wrong with that. All right. Um, I don't think we have any other questions. But it's a good question, uh, Stephanie, because um, it is a little bit confusing talking about fruit trees. And we're used to talking about root balls all the time. But in the case of bare root fruit trees, like Johnny said, it's essentially a stick <laughs> that you're planting. All right. <clears throat> the birthplace of fruit. So in this set of slides, I'll be going over where fruit is produced along different types of fruit trees, um, because depending on the fruit tree, it's um, it's produced in different places along the tree. All right, so for peaches and nectarines, you fruit is produced laterally on long branches. So alongside, so all along the long branch, you'll get a bud will, will produce a, fruit, uh, a peach or a nectarine. And um, it grows on one year old wood, which um, as Anne told me before, it's a, this is the reason why it's a good idea to prune your um, peaches to encourage new growth. That way you can get new, um, a new production, new peaches basically, or more peaches. And then for, uh, there we go, for apricots, cherries, and plums, you'll find root, uh, the fruit will grow uh, mostly laterally on spurs. And spurs are short stubs where the, um, that grow specifically for producing fruit buds and eventually fruits. Um, so for apricots, these spurs last for about three years. Plums and prunes, um, spurs last about five to 10 years. And for cherries, the spurs can last up to 10 years. And so for apples, pears, and Asian pears, you'll find the fruit being produced terminally on spurs. So this is the main location of fruit wood for apples and pears, uh, spurs last about five to eight years. So um, when it comes to fruit trees, you know, or trees in general, it's uh, typically requires patience. Young trees may not bear much fruit for the first few years, and they may not be until many years later where you get full product, full uh, fruit production. Um, and it's because of the development of fruit requires a lot of energy from the tree. And we can see an example of what that means for the tree in the next few slides. So alternate bearing is where um, the tree produces a heavy crop one year, and then the next year uh, you will get very little fruit after. And that's because of the energy it takes the tree to produce um, fruit. So in heavy years, the vegetative growth is reduced and the reverse is true, meaning you know when you get a lot of vegetation, you get more energy that saved up for uh, for uh, for next year to uh, produce fruit and to prevent alternate bearing or to lessen the effects of it. Um, it's read that you can um, whenever you get a heavy crop of fruit, you can start um, like taking out some of the fruit or like pruning the fruit basically so that the tree doesn't spend as much energy on the heavy crop. Uh, 
All right, Any so questions? far, no questions. So we can head on to uh, pruning. When to prune and why do we prune? The most common time of the year is during the dormant season, which is winter. Prune when leaves have dropped. This invigorates the plant, helps concentrate stored energy of fewer growth points on the tree. If the tree is left unpruned, most will get very, very large. The fruit becomes difficult to reach, crop fruit often wasted and attracts bugs and flies. And if it needs to be sprayed, it becomes very difficult because it's so large. Peaches and nectarines, these are the most vigorous. They're pruned to invigorate fruiting wood, to remove old weak growth, Prune to remove at least 50% of last year's growth. And also the thin branches to allow for space for light to reach throughout the tree and ripen the fruit on the inner branches. Apricot cherry and plum trees. We prune to thin wood to reduce shading for size and to promote new growth. Do not remove spurs. Prune to renew spurs after five to 10 years, top when they get too long. Pruning apple and pear trees to shorten and renew spurs. Again, do not remove spurs. If you prune off the spurs, they will not grow back. Summer pruning. Large trees make fruit picking difficult and sometimes very dangerous. You're trying to do two things at once. Summer pruning. Prune over vigorous or too large trees in the summer. Wait to prune until fruit is harvested or prune carefully to ensure fruit is protected from sun exposure. Ah, fruit bush training method. If you want to keep your fruit within arm's reach, there are some pruning guidelines for you in years one and two. Head the year old tree to 18 to 24 inches. In mid-spring, cut back new growth by half. And in mid-summer, cut subsequent growth back by half again. Thinning cuts for sunlight protection. You may need to prune one or two more times and use a training system depending on the tree variety. And we have a couple of examples here, left and right. Fruit bushes kept at desired height. And as you can see, no ladder required. Any questions? I don't see any. You want to go ahead, Hector? Um, so next. A set of slides we're going to go over um, commonly used training systems, which are ways that you can train your fruit tree to grow um, to grow uh, for convenience. Um, there is the open center and the central leader uh, training system. So for open center, it's mostly used for peaches, plums, apricots and apples, pears and nectarines and persimmons. And it starts off with heading the um, the fruit tree that you bought back about 18 to 24 inches and selecting scaffolds which are branches that you want to act as like your main branch that you're going to um, keep uh, during the first two growing seasons and then from there you prune as necessary uh, you prune prune as needed in the dormant seasons and then keep the center open during the summer from the start so here's an example of um, the two-year-old peach that was pruned open center. You can see on the right uh, side of the picture, the, uh, the scaffolding branches, like the main branches that are going to act as, um, as the main, like I said, the main branches you're gonna keep. And then the central leader uh, training system is mostly used for apples, pears, and Asian pears, where you s maintain the leader, which is the uh, center most vertical um, uh, um, branch, 
and you cut that to a desired height and you tie and stake lateral branches outward, meaning branches that grow off the side of this main leader and create about three to four whorls of branches. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like in the next uh, slide. So you can, from this picture, you can definitely see the central leader and then off growing off of that central leader, you can see the, uh, the world branches or the, the lateral growing branches that are um, like grown as like whorls, kind of like a, like, like a stick figure Christmas tree kind of thing. Then here's another diagram that shows you the process of the central leader training, uh, starting off from the, uh, just that headed tree. Um, and throughout the uh, diagram, you can see the uh, central leader and the, uh, the lateral growing uh, branches off of that, that eventually get tied to the central leader for support. And um, these methods are for when you first buy your, uh, your fruit tree. However, if you already have a fruit tree that has grown out of control, you can reduce the size of it um, in over a span of three years using steps from our free publication called Pruning an Overgrown Fruit Tree. And the link should be uh, emailed to every one of you, uh, this and other resources, hopefully. Any questions? I don't see any questions, uh, but yes, we will be emailing everybody these resources. And if people are watching later, they can go to our um, website where we have the um, presentation and other things that folks might want to download. But so far, uh, no questions. I think this is Johnny. Is this me? Okay. Yes. <laughs> fruit tree thinning. Small fruits cluster together. Let's thin these out. Why thin? Unthin fruits stay small and may rot without enough air circulation. On the left, you see the discolored and small fruit. And on the right, thin fruit reaches normal size. When and how to thin. When? When fruit is three quarters to one inch diameter, usually late April, early May. How? Well, spacing depends on type of tree that you have. Peaches, four to six inches. Apricots, three to five inches. Apples, thin one fruit per cluster or six inches. Pears, thin one fruit per cluster Bartlett, no thinning required. And fruit should not be touching at harvest. For example, on the left is your, are your peaches before you thin them. And on the right, you got approximately five or six inches in between each fruit after thinning. The ground after thinning. Oh, isn't that terrible? All that wasted fruit. Oh my goodness. That's, that's a hard job. Isn't it? That's always the hardest thing for me is to go out and thin fruit. Any questions on why or how to thin fruit? Uh, there was a question from Sori about, can you recommend any books with illustrations? And I happen to have the book we mentioned earlier, The Home Fruit Tree guide the home yeah. orchard uh home orchard thank you hector yeah. and i am yep, this looking one. do you I have, have a pull, copy have... too yeah i'm holding it up right now so this does it by... it seems like it's it's got a lot of like pretty good uh instructions i think mm. yeah i think we would recommend that one for sure and i can send you a link um you can purchase it off the uh a and r website uh, for that. Uh, and one thing I will say is last year or the year before I got a little bit behind on pruning um, or rather thinning my peach trees. And boy, did I notice a difference. Um, they were on there a little bit 
more tightly and I really had to pull them off. And it's best to do your peaches, nectarines, plums, apricots when the fruit is pretty small and it just, it'll just plop right off. In fact, I was talking to Ed Perry, our retired advisor, um, or actually maybe it was our other advisor, Carrie, uh, Dr. Carrie Arnold, who was mentioning you can even thin the flowers off once they've um, come out. Um, and Teresa's asking about thinning cherries. I, uh, I didn't read anything about that. Um, I don't know about Hector and Johnny, but I feel like there's already enough competition for them from the birds. Uh, <laughs> I've never, I've never thinned cherries. No, I, I have, have not heard of thinning no. cherries. Um, they're, since usually, they're such a light fruit. You're it's, usually lucky to get a heavy crop. Yeah. yeah and um, with, with the other fruit, you'll see, especially even peaches and nectarines, sometimes the branches will break. I've seen entire trunks go down. Apricots, just lots, yeah. too much fruit. Yeah. Great questions. Okay. We will keep going. Uh, I think it's still Johnny. Is that still Johnny? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Fruit tree cultivars for Stanislaus County climate zones, the USDA 9B and the Sunset Western Garden Book number 14. Fruit ripening categories, early season, late spring to early summer, which is mostly May and June, mid season, mid summer, July and August, and late season, late summer to fall, September, October. SF designation equals three does not need a pollinizer. It is self fruitful. Taste test winner. These are taste tests conducted at the Dave Wilson Nursery and we have designated some as the taste test winner. Can I just interject that back when I used to work at a local nursery, I believe it might have been 1998 or something like that. I got to go to some of these taste tests, which I'm not sure if they do anymore. And I made the mistake of overeating at the beginning. <laughs> I was not a very good taste tester. <laughs> um, for whatever reason, they started out with blueberries. And so I'd already eaten six different kinds of blueberries, too many. Then we got to the peaches and it was like, wow. But um, these taste tests are really cool because they have actual people come in and taste the fruit and rate them. So um, it's kind of neat. And we had mentioned Dave Wilson Nursery before. They are a wholesale nursery. So the public cannot purchase from them, but they sell to nurseries. Um, so uh, they have a lot of great information. Let's start off with apricots, and we have a Blenheim, early season, excellent flavor. Tilton, mid-season, good for canning. Moor Park, mid-season, rich in flavor. The Patterson, mid-season, fresh, used for dried or canning. And Tomcott, early season, large, tart flavor. And Tomcott, the asterisk is best with another pollinizer of any type. Apple cultivars for this area. Granny Smith is crisp and tart. The Gala, sweet and tart. Fuji, crisp and sweet. And those first three are good pollinizers for other apples. And we have the Jana Gold, crisp and juicy. The Mutsu, the very large apple crisp and flavorful. The Newton Pippin is a tart cooking apple, like the Granny Smith, and the Golden Russet, fresh for cider or for cooking. Asian pears. Unfortunately, Asian pears are prone to fire blight. Resistant cultivars are just not available. Prune out six inches from the source as soon as the fire blight appears, just cut it off. The different types of Asian pears. Chojuro is a coarse flesh, is tasty. Shinko, juicy and flavorful. 20th century, 
It's a white flesh, a very popular variety, and Hosu Juicy Sweet White Flesh. Cherries. Most cherries will ripen in May and June. Bing, early, the most popular cherry. Brooks, also early, earlier than Bing, in the sweet cherry. The Rainier, mid season, yellow and sweet. And Stella, early, rich and flavorful. And it is self fruitful. Pears, fire blight can be a major problem. Fire blight bacteria is moved around by bees and sprays are not effective. But you can't use fire blight resistant pears and you should. Comus is a large and a sweet and juicy. Seckle, that's a smaller pear. Pacum's trium, winter nellus and warren, all highly recommended. You see the pictures there on the right of the fire blight. Looks like someone took a lighter and just burned the little buds. Uh, peaches, our favorite. Mayprise, barely yellow, nearly freestone, sweet and tangy. Red Haven, mid season, yellow freestone, world's most widely planted peach. O. Henry, late season, yellow freestone, large, sweet and juicy. Arctic Supreme, mid season, white flesh, nearly freestone, and a taste test winner. Donut, now this is something new. Stark Saturn, mid season. It's a white donut shaped peach, which I know some people don't care for the donut shape, but I know kids love it because with one bite they can get right through it. And you will see on the peaches that you have peaches there for each of the seasons early, mid, and late. So you want a summer of peaches, you can choose the different varieties and have peaches right throughout the summer. Nectarines, we have a double delight. Mid-season, yellow freestone, and a taste test winner. Fantasia, mid-season, yellow freestone, very good flavor. Zeglo, late season, yellow, and superb flavor. Heavenly white, mid-season, white flesh freestone, and a taste test winner. Arctic star, early white flesh, semi-freestone, and also a taste test winner. Plums, you know, Santa Rosa, early, tangy, juicy, self-fruitful. Elephant heart, late season, rich in flavor. Satsuma, which requires a pollinizer, late season and sweet. Burgundy, mid-season, excellent flavor, self-fruitful. And Loroda, pollinizer required, late season and a taste test winner. Pluots, what are pluots? We got a cross between a plum, 70% plum and an apricot, 30% apricot. We have a flavor supreme, which is mid season and sweet. Flavor king, late season and a taste test winner. Flavor queen, late season, greenish flesh, and very sweet. And dapple dandy, late season taste test winner. And I can attest to that. I have a dapple dandy myself for the last 20 years and the texture and the flavor and the color are outstanding on a dapple dandy. There are also apriums. That's a 70% apricot and a 30% plum. And plum cuts that are about 50%, 50-50. You'll see some of these at the farmer's market and some of the stalls around town. Pretty interesting. Persimmons. They're self-fruitful, harvested in fall or winter. I bought myself a persimmon this month and just planted it so to bridge the gap between the soft fruit of the summertime and the citrus, the oranges in December. So I'm looking forward to my fufuyu, which is a flat, fresh like an apple. You can eat it right off the tree. 
as opposed to the hachia, which is appointed, astringent, and used mainly for baking. Although I have to say, once those um, hachias get ripe, you can eat them with a spoon. They're really good. Just don't make the mistake of eating them crispy because you won't forget it for at least 30 minutes. Yeah, maybe there's, two a, days. <laughs> there's, a fine, there's a fine point between when they're, they're hard and when they're soft and you got to get it exactly right. Yeah, Yeah, when they, they say astringent, yeah. yeah, they mean astringent. All right, so. Um, to conclude the presentation, I'll go over just some uh, pests, some common pests with the, associated with a few uh, fruit trees. Um, for apples and pears, uh, they may need protection from the coddling moth. So if you ever, you know, picture like the worm in an apple, that kind of scenario, it's because of the coddling moth. Um, so protection from the coddling moth needs to start in the springtime. And then uh, the UC IPM, so the... Um, University of California Integrated Pest Management uh, website has um, pest notes on coddling moth for more information of how uh, their life cycle and how to um, how to prevent them. And then the next slide. Um, so peach leaf curl, that's a nasty one. For peach leaf curl, um, uh, obviously it affects peaches, but it can also affect nectarines. It's caused by a fungal disease that um, overwinters in the uh, buds and twigs and is spread around by rain and wind. Um, and prevention is key. Prevention involves um, spraying your, uh, your peaches and nectarines with a copper-based fungicide um, in the late fall. And you can also uh, have a, apply a second, um, a second spray of um, this copper-based fungicide if, you have, uh, if there are like rainy winters. And so long as there aren't any buds forming, right? And you can, you can right. spray them a second time. And full disclosure, even though it's late January, I have not sprayed my tree because I just pruned it. <laughs> but luckily there aren't any buds yet. So I'm going to get away with uh, giving it a spray. And one thing I didn't mention on this slide is to spray until the tree is dripping. That way you really get it coated because uh, otherwise the peach leaf curl will creep in. Mm -hmm. And then the last one we're going to talk about briefly is the uh, plum leaf curl, which is caused by an aphid as opposed to, uh, you know, a, a fungal infection when it comes to like peach leaf curl. And um, it's typically, it's, it's caused by stress uh, whenever your tree is under stress. So make sure that it's watered properly and taken, and taken care of, uh, right? And then just confirm that it is um, caused by an aphids you can unroll or un yeah unroll the uh, the curled leaves to actually see the uh, the insect on the inside of them any questions everybody's gone silent maybe they <laughs> asked all the questions they had <laughs> maybe they're hungry and they didn't have dinner so at this time uh, if you do have a question you can Hang on to it and, and type it into the Q&A or the chat. And uh, Vicki, our local reference librarian for Stanislaus County, go ahead and take it away. Hi, everyone. How are you? Um, so yes, my name is Vicki Salinas, and I am a reference librarian at the Modesto Library. Um, and um, we are open to the public. We've I've had a few questions like that. Um, although we do require mask wearing inside. But yes, our 13 libraries are now open. Um, our Turlock library is now open. Uh, we had a nice renovation, so uh, visit that. It's newly renovated and our Empire library has moved. So we have had some changes recently. Um, I did wanna mention quickly that um, the book that was mentioned earlier, uh, The Home Orchard, we actually have copies available if anyone is interested in checking out. Um, I see some physical copies um, in our different branches. Um, but on the screen and what I'll be talking about today is um, how you can uh, use our e-resources, specifically our e-book services um, to check out books related to gardening, um, in, in this case, fruit trees. Uh, so one of the services that we have is Hoopla or Hoopla Digital. Um, and this is an app that you can download to your smartphone. Um, you can also use it on your laptop or home computer or on, onto a tablet. 
And Hoopla is really nice. It's really easy to use and it's always free to use as long as you have a Stanislaus library, um, library card number. And we can easily get you a library card number if you, if you don't have one yet. Um, so you can ask me questions, if any questions regarding that later on. Um, so Hoopla, uh, I just showed a screenshot of when I did a search uh, for fruit trees. So quite a, quite a bit to choose from there. Um, and then information about Hoopla, and then eventually I'll be showing you about Cloud Library can be found on our website listed there, the www.stanislauslibrary.org. Vicki, I hope it's okay if I mention this one right here, Grow a Little Fruit Tree, was written by my former boss at Scenic Nursery um, because she was kind of in on documenting what went uh, what happened with the fruit bush method. So this is a uh -huh. great book. It has tons of pictures and it's it's really well well written. So I highly recommend that. Yeah, I'm glad that's that's on there. And so this is just a blown up picture of a, additional books that can be found on Hoopla, um, the how to prune fruit trees and how to grow fruit trees for beginners. Um, so it's, it's really easy to download and to read off of your device. And again, always free to use. Um, and then I'll mention our second ebook service, which is Cloud Library. Um, so sometimes uh, Hoopla, Hoopla and Cloud Library are both ebook services, but there are different materials found in each of those. So if you're not finding enough or just want to see what more you can find, Cloud Library would also be good to look at. Um, Whereas Hoopla, Hoopla does have things other than eBooks. You can also do music, movies, TV shows. Cloud Library is just gonna be eBooks um, or e-audiobooks. Um, and this again, it has its own separate app that you can download to your devices or um, computer and do some searching. And the great thing about eBooks is that they do check out for three weeks. You'll never get any fines. They just return after the three weeks are up, you can always check it back out if you did need more time. Um, so here I just have a picture of uh, one of the available books on Cloud Library, the Pruning Answer book. And then I just wanna mention that um, at the library, you know, we're not doing too much of the in-person programming because of COVID. Um, so we do have quite a bit um, virtual programs available. You can always find that on our website at stanislauslibrary.org under the events and classes tab. Um, so programs like this will be up on our calendar. And um, you can also sign up to get um, emailed calendars uh, related to our monthly events. So do keep us in mind um, if there's anything else that you're interested in learning about, because we still have classes going just more virtual than not. And just showing you our website um, at stanislauslibrary.org. Uh, lots of different information can be obtained there. We're much more than books, although books, you know, it's always good to, to check out. Um, but we do offer, um, in addition to events, Modesto and Salida Libraries, our passport acceptance facilities. Um, we're trying to do a lot um, of grant projects. So yeah, check out our website and, and see um, what's new. As you can see there, we also do some reading challenges. We have a winter reading challenge going on now. Thank you. All right, thank you, Vicki. And thanks to uh, Hector and Johnny and all of you watching. Uh, you will receive an email survey from us about three months from now, and it is a post-test just to find out what you've learned, and um, it gives us information on um, how we can help our program grow, and it shows the impact that we have in the community, and it takes less than five minutes, so I will thank you ahead of time for looking out for that email. And then we have some uh, resource slides and some of you may be saying, wait, I downloaded the slides and they didn't have Vicki's library slides on them. And that would be Anne's fault. Uh, so I will upload a new copy and send that to you all here in the next day or so, uh, so that you can have that. And uh, then as I mentioned earlier, we have more classes coming up and Vicki has it on the calendar for the Stanislaus County Library that we will be talking about spring vegetables this next month and then citrus and some other classes. Um, and so I was just thinking while we're doing this that our next class
class about fruit trees this summer will be about pests and diseases. Uh, but one thing you do want to make sure to um, think about is coddling moth, which is coming up, and uh, we'll feature a post about it on our um, blog, The Stanislaus Sprout. And uh, I was just looking at the comments. Juanita says, thank you for the great info. See you on the next one. And uh, yeah, it looks like folks enjoyed the class, which is great.